welcome to Think Tech. Um, we have uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy, and we have Mina and Marco and me on Mondays at 12 noon, all to talk about energy here on this, on this network here, the Think Tech network. And we are delighted, and, and more than delighted, we are ecstatic <laughs> with this show. Uh, first, uh, Marco Mangelsdorf joins us by, uh, by Skype audio from, uh, from ProVision Solar in Hilo. Welcome, Marco. Greetings, Jay and Jay, and uh, I have a special quote of the day I wanted to share with you, which goes, in this world, you must be oh so smart or oh so pleasant. Well, for years, I was smart. I recommend pleasant. And that was from one Elwood P. Dowd, who was the star character in the movie Harvey, played wonderfully by Jimmy Stewart. So I, I can't tell you how happy I am to be with two incredibly pleasant dudes <laughs> such as you two. Well, let's introduce the second Jay. <laughs> Jay Griffin, just recently appointed by David Ige as the third commissioner on the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, turns out to be a really important um, job right now and a really important appointment for all of us. And we are ecstatic that he was appointed and, uh, and that he's sitting right now on the PUC. Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And good to, well, see you on the screen and hear from you, Marco. Yeah. So, let's, you. so let's talk about, um, you know, the background of it all. Um, you were appointed, uh, what, a couple months ago, I guess? Uh, in May and became effective June 5th. Yeah, okay. And uh, you're an interim appointment uh, awaiting confirmation by the, the Senate. Um, how does that work? And you're sitting right now. This is... You know, fabulous. Yes, sitting interim commissioner, um, been there for a little over three weeks, and we've had a couple of big orders that I'll talk about in a second, or relatively big, important things. Um, and as you said, I still have to, I have to go through confirmation. I've been talking with senators and getting to know them, uh, giving them a chance to get to know me, and we'll see whether this comes up during a special session or is taken up during a, the regular session. What makes you different, Jay? Why do you, why do you think uh, why do you think David Ige appointed you? Oh, well, <laughs> you have to ask him on the show someday. Okay, I will. No, what I what I told him when I had a chance to talk to him, I've always been a strong supporter of the state's vision, clean energy goals, and having the opportunity to contribute to the transformation that's ongoing, I think is a remarkable remarkable opportunity that I was thrilled to have an opportunity when he asked. I've spent a lot of time working in the energy policy and some of the, the renewable technologies. So I think that I bring some of that focus to the position, as well as spending four years at the commission as a chief of policy and research, been deeply engaged a lot of the key dockets that we have going on and the ongoing transformation. That's perfect. You've been in policy for the most critical four years of our history on energy, that's for sure. You've seen, you've seen the most incredible things happen. You've seen, for example, the next era process. That was mind blower. <laughs> I like to say the best is still yet to come. And that was part of what was intriguing about this position, the yeah. ability to help see that through. Yeah. Well, let's take a moment to go through your bio in terms of uh, training, uh, your arrival on these shores, your, uh, what you did for HNEI, what you did for uh, the PUC before. Um, and um, you know, generally what you bring to the table. Sure, so I, I actually first arrived in Hawaii in 2000 and uh, worked for a nonprofit on Kauai. I was fortunate to meet your other host, Mina Morita at the time and get to know her and her family. She and, likes you a lot, by the way, just, <laughs> just to add that. Well, she did hire me at that, or offer a job at that point to come work on her staff when she was in the, uh, the chair of the energy committee in the house and worked with her and helped uh, that session we helped pass the net energy metering law and at the time were the renewable portfolio goals and that experience working with her particularly in that session really you know brought uh, my interest to the energy uh, energy issue and I went back to graduate school and worked on a PhD focused on energy policy and, and modeling of energy systems and came back, was fortunate to come back to Hawaii and offered a job at the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute and started in 2009. Spent several years working on different grid integration studies and demonstration projects. And the chair in 2012 asked if I would take a leave to come work at the commission as the chief of policy and research. It was supposed to be two years and ended up four years. 
Um, so I went back to HNEI uh, for about 10 months until the governor called uh, a few weeks ago. All right, Ben, you know, it's so interesting. Uh, was it a surprise, by the way? Because you were in the policy arena for a long time. You, you know, there are a few people who have been so intensely involved in policy for such a long period of, in their careers. Was it a surprise to get the phone call? Um, yes, it's always a surprise. I mean, you, you, it's part of the reason, as I talk to my wife, you, never, you may never get that phone call again. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, you're, you never know until the person's on the other end of the line and says, do you want to do this? From the time you decided to study energy, and policy and energy, which is, I mean, that was a really propitious decision and a wonderful decision in these times. You know, you were, you were futuristic. You knew, I think, what was going to happen. Um, how, how has your view of it changed, if at all? I mean, are you involved in a dynamic where you become more passionate, more interested, more infused, you know, with, with the subject? Oh, that's a great question. I think Part of it, Hawaii has really always been on the leading edge, um, you know, with the, the great wealth of renewable opportunities that we have here. And, you know, what we've seen is technology is only continuing to improve. And what we thought was nearly impossible a while back, um, we continue to see breakthroughs that make it far more, prob you know, probable, lower cost and nearer time frames than, than we had thought even when I started studying these things 10 years ago or so even a few years ago with some of these technologies. Yeah. Marco, your turn. What do you want to know about Jay Griffin? <laughs> so Jay, you've, you've, been, you've been in the big chair now for three or so weeks. What has surprised you the most as you've ascended uh, to, to one of the three big chairs there? Sure. Uh, well, a couple of, maybe one observation. You know, I, when I started in 2012, you know, one of the tasks or goals that MENA gave me was to help oversee uh, rehiring and, and reform of the, the policy and research section. And so when I compare the staff we have now to that time frame, it was, it was part of the reason I was interested in coming back. There's just been substantial increase in the capacity and the professional expertise, and it's, it's really exciting to work with the, the people that we have at the commission makes our job as commissioners easier, can trust their judgment, and really dig into the issues that we have. So that's a, not so much a surprise, but that's been um, really good. That I knew that, or I thought that would be the case, and it's been the case so far. Um, maybe a, a surprise, we spend far more time dealing with non-energy related matters than, than even I had anticipated, because mm. um, I was a little less involved in some of those things. So a little more time signing motor carrier related orders, um, but we had, it, so that 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 was probably the biggest surprise so far. Um, had a good working relationship with with Chair Wase and Commissioner Akiba. I've known them for a while now, uh, yeah. so I'm, I'm I'm actually thrilled to be back and have been enjoying it very much. Yeah, and and last Friday you signed an order. Yes. Is that the first one you signed? No, 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 we've been, actually, like I said, there's 10, 15 orders a day with some of these other matters. So there's been quite a few. But yeah, I wanted to talk about, uh, hasn't kind of gone out in the news yet, but it was posted on our document management system. The commission approved a 20 megawatt solar project. This is one that the point electric companies asked for that they would build on and operate themselves. It's been the, the first of that kind in a while. Uh, it's, it came in at relatively good pricing at nine and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Mm. Uh, the commission- That's pretty good. It's, it's an improvement from, it's a steady progression and improvement from um, each iteration of these projects. Ah, good. And you know, the commission's been trying to help facilitate the one, ones that, you know, as the, the downward trend in pricing continues. So we approved it um, within the timelines that the parties had asked for. And you know, one, one thing I was talking to Jay about as we started, there was one element, uh, the approval, that is relatively new. We've, we've asked the companies to come back with what we call a shared saving incentive mechanism. What is that? The way this works, the, the companies have gotten bids for what they think it'll cost to build this project, but until they go out and get the final bidding and build it, we don't actually know. We've just said that you can go forward, uh, build the project, and certain costs are capped. 
but this gives them an incentive to go out and be really aggressive in lowering the cost from what they received their estimates. You know, we know that TV costs are going down, so we'd expect that from the time they got the first bids to construction, there may be opportunities for savings. And so if the utilities can come in with a lower number, they have the potential to share some of that savings, partly with customers, partly with their investors. And so we think this, we, we hope that this will give them good incentive to go out and be really aggressive as they do the, the final bidding and the actual construction of the project. So there's if some I new could, things here. I could here. follow up just on that exact subject. Uh, go my ahead. Friend Jay, Jay's, uh, my friends Jay and Jay, it would be for, for you, Jay Griffin, do you think there's still um, a justification for preferential pricing to be justified in terms of uh, renewable energy projects feeding into the grid, or are we really in a place where that essentially those days have come and gone and it really is a focus on the lowest uh, cost-effective uh, renewable energy pricing we can get? So I'm going to... I'm going to have to duck on that question a little bit, Marco. I think, as you know, we have a proposal before us that is uh, <laughs> seeking a decision on that very, uh, partly uh, on that question. Um, I mean, there is language in statute um, you know, giving, giving the commission the ability to consider preferential rates in the, the review of these projects. Um, we've had a, a, a prior decision related to Maui County on this. So I, I, I'm going to have to duck on this one. Good choice. <laughs> Excellent Understood. response. Sorry, I know. Um, it's, I mean, it, it, I'll go back to what I was saying. I mean, I, I think from, from the commission standpoint, reviewing all of these projects going forward, the expectation is that costs are going to continue to decline. Um, it, we, we've seen that trend with a lot of the, the with solar projects, with wind projects, and particularly with the inclusion of battery storage. Why is that? Why are they declining that way? Do you have a handle on that? Sure. I think there's a. It's been a few trends, you know, partly going on here in Hawaii, but but largely it's just been the the growth of of that industry globally has driven down the cost of producing a lot of the key components. Uh, so the the Solar panels, inverters, a lot of the, the, the key core components, energy storage technologies, is, uh, the costs are declining rapidly. So we're seeing you know, declining prices across the board. I think there's also been a lot more local experience and commercial expertise developed in developing these projects. So we're, we're bearing the benefits of all of these things going on. And I think you know, our viewpoint is that we, we from the, the perspective of reviewing the projects, we expect to see continue declines. Right. Now, you, now you've got a handle on the trend, and, and you well, want to make could, sure If I could just continues. momentarily uh, channel uh, Chairman Randy Iwase, he spoke at the Verge conference, uh, gave a, a presentation which I read with great interest that our friend Henry Curtis posted on his blog, and what I'll quote to you is the following. We have internal criteria, a downward trajectory for energy costs as we look at projects, as we look at dockets. At that level, we're going to lead. At that level, we're going to make the decision. So I would, uh, I mean, I guess my argument would be that uh, there certainly was a time when renewable energy needed a boost up, needed incentives, because uh, I've been at this a very, very long time, and I, I certainly very much appreciate those subsidies and incentives, but I think we are largely past that time where, you know, there, there have been such re cost reductions, especially with solar PV, that uh, there needs to be a focus on what's the best bang for the rate payer, what's going to, do, what's going to be the be best path to be able to drive down rate uh, costs and, and uh, people's electric utility bills. So, Comment? I look forward with eagerness to see how the commission decides on that particular docket regarding uh, Huho Nua. <laughs> Uh, no more comments. What I want to get out of this, Thank though, you. is there's, there's some uh, interesting groundbreaking things happening here. Number one is the utility itself is in involved, invested in this in this uh, project, the one you mentioned at the, at the Navy. Yeah, two, it'll two, be, they'll, they'll own and operate this one. That's unusual. That hasn't happened very much. Well, the most recent one a few years ago, the commission denied. Yeah, okay. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, and they made a policy choice back in 2008 that they weren't going to be uh, a proprietor. Uh, the utility didn't want to actually be the owner, but they seem to have softened on that idea. 
There's been, and, and there was another recent project, the Schofield Barrick uh, power plant is another project that the commission approved that uh, is a new uh, partially biofuel mm -hmm. energy source. So, I mean, well, it seems to be changing. Uh, and, and it's interesting that it's changing on for these military installations. I would just, so. It's reviewed project by project. There's yeah. been, you know, kind of no clear across the board policy decision. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, we, we, but they're coming at you, though. And it's changing from the utility point of view, don't you think? They, they want to do this. Yeah, they want to do it. And uh, again, getting back to the specific decision, I mean, I think on most of the criteria, particularly some of the ones that Marco mentioned, you know, this, this ticked all the boxes. And, you know, again, we tried to look at ways that we could further keep, you know, bringing costs down with these projects and align that, that incentive with, with what the utilities, uh, as they go forward and, and bid and do the construction. It's all good. That, so that was, you know, that was an exciting one to be a part of. And I think we were talking before the show also, we'd received the draft of the utilities grid modernization strategy. Uh, just just last, last week. Yeah. Just last Friday also. Uh, something that the commission had asked for as a part of a prior order, dismissing the, the earlier uh, iteration of this. And, you know, that's come in, came in on Friday. I think the utilities have done a, a much broader effort with community engagement, customer engagement, and, and that, that shows them what they've submitted. And they think they plan to spend another two months or so soliciting feedback and submitting a final plan to the commission by the end of August. Yeah, and, this, and the period of this draft uh, consideration is that they want to open it up for review and comment by constituents, by, by the public, I suppose. Yeah, and I think they wanted to give it enough time where they could both get the comment and have a you know, legitimate amount of time to go incorporating that feedback and, and make revisions. Yeah, it was, and it's not too long a period. I mean, one always is concerned when things take a long time. Um, to wit, the PSIP, this seven months. I don't know if you're working at that or looking at it. Do you have any feelings about the speed at which the commission should move? The, well, having been there for four years, um, sure, it's something that, um, I mean, the staff, it weighs on us heavily at times. Certainly the people's criticism saying that we're dragging some of these things on too long. Uh, too long. Um, so I think there's a balance there. I mean, the commission does have a job in reviewing, reviewing carefully a lot of the things that are before it. It's been a pretty complicated time. I mean, the, the, the kind of the, the, particularly these larger plans, far more complicated than they used to be in the past. Um, so I, I can say it was one of my reasons for wanting to come back, was to help us do our job. It's not always quicker is better, but I think a lot of, a lot of cases we can move these things faster. Again, why I wanted to reiterate on our, our last order, we have hit the timelines that people have requested for some of these, you know, modest-sized projects. We're going to take a short break. Marco, Jay, uh, we'll be right back after that to talk more about what happened at Verge. I'd like to know uh, some of the initiatives and some of the, the things you see as the priorities going forward. We'll be Great. right back. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way. There's got to be solution. How to make a brighter day? What do we do? We've got to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Try a little more, more than ever before. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Jay Griffin and also Marco Mangelsdorf, and uh, we're talking about mm, Jay's recent appointment and his being seated. He's actually seated now on the PUC. It is complete, and that's great. Uh, so congratulations again, Jay. Uh, Marco, you had a question. You were burning with a question. Let, let, let's yeah, go to that. For Dr. Griffin, uh, 
Yeah, one of the biggest things that's happened energy-wise in our state over the past several years was the attempt of uh, NextEra Energy in Florida to purchase uh, Hawaiian Electric Industries uh, without uh, the bank. In other words, purchase the utility companies. And uh, I saw you there day in, day out, Jay, even though I wasn't uh, at the hearings each and every day. I was there enough to, to see you in the background there over by the windows. And my question to you is, what are your principal takeaways of that process? And more importantly, what are, what's your takeaway your takeaways as far as the decision that was made to uh, to turn down next year as a bid without prejudice? What, what what are kind of the principal lessons that you got out of that long 17 or so months, uh, 18, 19 months uh, journey? Uh, good question. So a few things. I, as you noted, I, I was one of the kind of the key staff on the core team um, involved in, 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 well, really almost, almost every aspect of the commission's work on this. Uh, so let me take this in a few parts, I think. So I think one of the lessons I learned, you know, process, well, the, the, I mean, this was the biggest case that I think it ever come before the commission, and, and we looked at all of each other and said probably, possibly ever in our careers, and understood the importance to the state. Um, and so the process was was critically important. And you know there has been some criticism of the commission taking too long, but I think um, it was important. We did an island wide public listening session or sessions um, that were, I mean, remarkably well attended in almost every every location that we went to. Um, so we went, you know, anyone in the public could show up, provide their comments. You know, this was before, well before we started the evidentiary hearing. You know, we had a very well laid out, you know, process for the parties for filing um, all of their briefs and replies before the case. We, we also accepted every party who made a petition to, to intervene. We, we gave, at least we gave people participant status. So we tried to be inclusive um, and, and get the feedback from all the different perspectives that were here in the state. As you noted, we had a 22-day evidentiary hearing. Um, some of the reasons for that taking so long were, I mean, the commission gave the opportunity for everybody to question each other. Parties didn't have to question certain witnesses. So I think some of that was, was in the, w within the applicant's control on how long they wanted that to take, but they, they chose to question everyone that had, had been a formal witness. Um, you know, and then we made our deliberations and, or, you know, as staff, we looked over and reviewed things, but you know, the commissioners made their decision, which was well known. I, you know, the main takeaways, I think, were partly in the attachment to that order, or, you know, the, the order itself was very long, gave the reasoning for the decision itself. Um, but some of the takeaways to me were also if, you know, Others looking at this process in the future, we gave, the commission gave guidance on some key elements to take into account. And I think, you know, again, I go back to process was important here from the commission standpoint. You know, so there's an expectation there, but as well as, you know, how another party may want to go about that in the future and, and build possible support among, among a broad constituency and, and instead of people uh, that are all affected by a, a, a proposal of that nature. Yeah. So those are the uh, ways. <laughs> key thing. I mean, uh, I again, I I think my view it was a, I mean, it was an extraordinary opportunity to take a part, uh, take part of a, uh, something like that. It's part of why I felt like I could be prepared to be a commissioner, um, having kind of seen that the broad feedback that we got from people throughout the state and get an understanding of the the different viewpoints. Um, but, you know, we'll see, you know, what, what the future holds. Yeah. So, Jay, as you were sitting there, or as you were sitting in the background there, did it ever, ever cross your mind that you might be sitting in one of the three big chairs at some point? <laughs> Actually, no, because um, I, at the time, I, I think I said it earlier, I was on, I, during my whole time as staff at the commission, I was on leave from the university. And that was renewed on an annual basis. 
and you know, after four years, they started asking, you know, you're starting to look like somebody else's staff and not a university faculty <laughs> member. Um, so, you know, kind of towards the tail end, we were already planning basically that I was going to, at some point, I was going to go back to the university. And, you know, the commitment I, commitment I made to the chair was to help see through from the staff standpoint kind of our, our final role in the process. And that at that point, I had to go back to the university. And so, uh, you know, I, my planning was on, you know, what I was going to do next when I went to the university, not that I was going to be up on the, the stage at some point. Marco, you wanted to ask about, um, you know, the, the one company initiative at Hawaiian Electric. Why don't you ask that, that question now? Sure. Do you, I'm sure you're aware, uh, Jay, that the, Alan Oshima's, uh, one of his big pushes since he's been uh, taking the big chair at Hawaiian Electric is his one company initiative and uh, that may be with an eye at some point to having, let's say, a single electric rate structure for all five of their service territories, all five of their islands that they serve. And I was wondering if you'd had a chance to think about that at all as to the desirability or feasibility of that type of uh, approach. Well, the, okay. So, which part? The well, okay. Let me let me take the first part. The kind of consult. I mean, the, yeah, I've I've been briefed on their one company approach, and actually, I think it, it goes back several years. Um, the the thought of, of of going through that, and I mean, my understanding is they've particularly certain core functions of the company they've tried to consolidate, um, try and reduce some of the um, overlap that they had get consistency in certain procurement and engineering practices across the different companies. So I think, you know, the, from a just kind of uh, getting, gaining efficiencies across the company standpoint, uh, sure, it makes a lot of sense. As far as the, you know, a move towards single rates across the companies, I know this has come up in, in a couple different proposals in the past. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think to the extent, I mean, we're, we're always going to be supportive of where you can find efficiencies, you know, without kind of sacrificing some of the, the operations. But as far as, you know, where I see that potentially headed, yeah, I would have to see, a, you know, specific proposals that the companies would put forward. Um, just going to the, uh, we're, we only have a minute or two left. Um, you, you spoke well, about. It went fast. It, it goes fast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's why you have to come back. Uh, you talked about three, you know, principal mm, um, issues, uh, uh, trends, uh, events uh, that you thought were important. What what are those three? Sure, thanks, Jay. And I've I've talked with Marco a little bit about this in the past. Yeah, you know, I, I, we have a lot of different proposal or proposals and dockets before the commission, and and I've been asked whatever. What do I see as the priorities by many people as I've stepped in this role and to categorize. Uh, looking at the next round of procurement of utility scale renewables, the companies have asked to start up bidding on every island. It's going to be a major new round of purchasing. And, you know, as we talked about earlier, the expectation is that we're going to continue to realize, you know, declines in cost for these projects. Uh, we have a number of different dockets related to the ongoing reform of distributed energy resources and developing new customer choice options, um, and they're in various stages. But I think you know one of my areas of priority focus will be you know bringing forward some of these reforms more quickly, and helping stabilize you know what I know has been a challenging period for that market, but as well as develop new options. And then, because I talked earlier, uh, ongoing reform of the utilities business model and some of the regulatory practices overseeing that. You know, the chair has talked a couple times in the past about the commission's intent to un, uh, in, uh, open a performance-based rate-making docket. I think that'll be a, a, a large, comprehensive effort. But or shared savings, like in that uh, deal with the Navy. Yeah. Exactly. And so those are some some elements of that what that whole structure could look like and you know I did want to focus on that proposal because I, I also wanted a lesson is that has been that we have a lot of discrete opportunities where we can implement or test some of these ideas and not just have to wait for some some large comprehensive docket to come to resolution over several years so I think we're going to use that approach where we see appropriate as we try and resolve this and across all these different topics how do you see the tension between 
um, you know, uh, solar on the on the utility side of the line and solar on the rooftop side of the line. Because we've watched solar installers, you know, decline. And Marco has kept close notes on that for the past, uh, what, two years and more. Uh, where's that going to go? I mean, it, you know, to me, it seems to be that the, the utility side of the line is growing in terms of the, the size and scope of solar installations. How do you see it unfolding in the future? Great. I think we're going to need all these resources to meet the state's energy goals, um, given our current, you know, relatively high cost, and we're we're going to see a lot of interest in customer choice type technology. So I, I guess I try not to see it so much as a, a, a tension between the two that we're going to try and set policies in place that find a balance. Mm. So uh, one other thing is, uh, you know, going forward, we, you know, we've, we've had a kind of cloud over us for that 19-month period in which uh, NextEra was at issue. And then, you know, we, and then we kind of were still reeling. I think we, I mean the whole community, yeah. still reeling for a few months after that. But it seems to me, and you were there, you spoke. In fact, all the commissioners spoke at the Verge conference just last week. And uh, it seems to me that there's, uh, there's, a, there's a light somehow at the end of the tunnel at the the cloud is coming off somehow. Um, do you agree with that? And what role does the commission have, you know, in, in taking the next steps, if you will, going forward and um, sort of speeding up the process toward 100%? Yeah. So one, yeah, I think um, there was the question of how the merger would be dealt with as a big cloud, uh, just area of uncertainty. And then I think the next one is how the commission's going to rule on some of these larger dockets and setting forth some of these uh, procurement processes or kind of the new programs and, and, and tariffs that new resources are going to, uh, that customers will be involved in. So I, I know there's a lot of uh, interest in how we're going to work on those in the next few months, and that's why I've listed them as my priorities. I, I see that, you know, where, where kind of these, Regulatory decisions are the layer of uncertainty right now, and clarifying those sooner, I think, will bring. I, I just I see a lot of great opportunity across all these fronts in the next few years, and so our our path is to help make some of these decisions. We'll do the best job that we can, and I think as we bring more clarity, then there'll be great opportunities across the board. Great, Marco. Um, it's time for us to summarize and close, and I. I want to leave that to you. Well, it's hard for me to uh, follow in the footsteps of J&J &J over there, but I think <laughs> it's been a great uh, first gathering of the three of us. Hopefully, Mina can join us the next time because, I mean, we could go on for considerably louder than cons considerably longer than our allotted time, and I just think it's uh, great to be on with the two of you, and I hope we can continue the conversation as we go boldly where few island chains have gone before. <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you for having me on. And as I said to Jay earlier, I hope to come back with um, many reports of good progress in the coming years. Great. Thank you so much, Jay Griffin. Thanks. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, great, guys. Great to have you guys on. I hope we can do it again soon. Likewise. Aloha. Aloha. Thanks.